ella. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Counterfactual Gaming, the gaming channel where if there's something historical to do in a video game, we don't do it. Now, before we get started, I'd just like to remind everyone that if you like what you see, go ahead and put a like and a sub on the video. And if you have any comments or questions, go ahead and put them down below. And I'll be more than happy to go ahead and answer those questions, at least to the best of my ability. Who knows? I may not have a good answer for you, but I'll have an answer for you. Now, I'm starting this video with an attack on four Yamatos with a bunch of U.S. submarines because today I want to talk about the Navy. The Navy and Hearts of Iron. What you can do with it and how it works. So while I put the U.S. and Japanese navies into a Groundhog Day loop of submarines attacking Yamatos, what do I mean that I want to talk about the Navy? Well, I don't want to talk about just, like, weird nitpicky stuff about navies. I don't want to talk about specific naval plans. What I want to do today is just talk about basic naval stuff. Uh, it's specifically kinds of myths or misconceptions players have about naval stuff in Hearts of Iron. There's a lot of good information out there on the internet about how to do naval stuff in Hearts of Iron, but there's also a lot of good advice that only makes sense if you're a player with a lot of experience. And because a lot of that stuff is primarily useful for more experienced players, I want to cover just some really basic myths and misconceptions for novice players to help you understand some things before you go all into building a 500 super heavy battleships and then you can't understand why it's working or not working or why you can't afford to build the ships or even basic stuff like why are my planes not behaving correctly but before i list all of those myths and misconceptions i want to make a general statement about naval warfare in hearts of iron and yes i keep showing the submarines attacking the Yamatos for a reason. Don't worry, it'll make sense later. A lot of players say Navy is not important in Hearts of Iron. And what they really mean by that is that when you're facing the AI, there are ways of gimmicking the AI to bypass the need or usefulness of a Navy. But to be perfectly frank, naval warfare in Hearts of Iron can be rewarding, can be fun, and if you want to not just abuse the AI in very specific glitchy ways, understanding how the naval mechanics work is really important. So with that out of the way, let's talk about naval myths and misconceptions in Hearts of Iron 4. There are five primary myths or misconceptions about naval warfare in Hearts of Iron 4 that have sort of propagated themselves on YouTube, on the internet, uh, around the Paradox Forum community, and just generally by word of mouth. These are, one, carrier planes actually need range. Two, naval upgrades are never worth it. Three, surface ship torpedoes are actually useful against capital ships. Four, the naval aircraft designer affects any plane with torpedoes. And five, the rating designer is just for submarines. Now, each of these myths and misconceptions are born out of either weird things in the UI or players giving advice to other players that's not necessarily bad advice, but that makes sense in the context of something you already know. And they're assuming that you're an experienced player who knows what they're talking about. And we're going to drill down into each of these myths and misconceptions, and we're going to do it uh, showing in-game stuff. All right, so let's talk about carrier aircraft and range, okay? I see this question all the time. Paradox Forum, elsewhere, players will ask, does range matter on carrier aircraft? And the answer I'm going to tell you is it doesn't matter in carrier combat. It matters if you order planes on carriers to, like, go do other things. But in actual ship-to-ship -ship combat that has carriers in it, it doesn't matter. And I'm going to show you, okay? We're going to... Do, do this test two different ways. I've got two different planes we're going to test out. One is the BM-2. It is the worst airplane you could possibly put torpedoes on on an aircraft carrier. It's an interwar carrier naval bomber airframe with the light torpedo mounting. This is from the summer beta, in case you didn't know. 
and a tier one engine. No range upgrades or nothing. This plane has a range of 300 kilometers and a naval attack of 13 with a naval targeting of five. Then I'm gonna run a test with the BTD destroyer, which is an advanced carrier naval bomber airframe with a tier four engine, drop tanks, and two extra sets of fuel tanks, giving it a range of 1,462 kilometers, but it has the same exact torpedoes on it. So it has a naval attack of 13 and naval targeting of five. Now, if range matters in carrier combat, this plane, this BTD destroyer, should perform better than the BM-2. If you take a look at these air and sea regions in the Pacific, like the Philippine Sea, this is a huge area. 300 kilometers covers practically nothing. But we're going to see that it, it performs the same. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop a save right here. And I'm going to call this range test save. Okay. Then I'm going to go into the console and cheat in ALE, which is 10,000 of every type of thing. And I have a fleet right here under Ernest King that has three aircraft carriers, a light cruiser, and 25 destroyers. And I'm going to mount some aircraft on it. Okay, we've got Ranger, Lexington, and Saratoga. So I'm going to add six of the worst wings to each of them. And then I'm, I'm going to order them to sail to the Philippine Sea. Now it's just going to be this fleet. Now, I've already ordered the Japanese to sail the, their four Yamatos into the Philippine Sea. And as you can tell, we are already at war. And I have turned off the AI. So this naval battle is just going to happen regardless. And I don't care about the results. I just want you to see if these carrier planes are actually functioning well. Okay, so we're going we're gonna to sail them out there. Yeah, I don't care about that. Zoom, 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 zoom. Okay, we are now in combat. Now, I don't expect uh, either side to, to, to do well because these are not properly set up fleets. I just want to analyze carrier aircraft performance. There we go. Okay, now, we lost one carrier to Yamato's guns already because I'm running the clock super fast because there's no battleships in the screen anymore. But I want you to look at these. These planes are already hitting the Japanese battleships. Naval bombers are hitting, naval bombers are hitting, and okay, all the carriers are dead because they've got no battleships to screen for them. Naval bombers are having a significant impact before their carriers are being destroyed. That's the worst planes I could have possibly put on there. Now, let's go back, rewind to the previous save. We're gonna test with the good aircraft and see if they do better. Now, I'm gonna anticipate that, again, they're gonna do badly. We're going to do ALE. We're going to turn the AI off. Go into my thing. We're going to add planes to this. But this time we're going to add the BTT destroyers. And we're going to see if the BTT destroyers have better mission efficiency. And the answer is going to be no. Okay. I should also point out that none of these ships are trained well either while... So the Yamatos have an advantage there as well. And we're going to talk about those Yamatos in a little bit later. Okay, we're sailing back to the Philippine Sea. I don't care about building in Florida right now. I'm going to order Ernest King to attack at all costs. Okay. Already lost a cruiser. But as you can see, dive bombers. Okay. If we take a look here. The BTDs are also damaging ships, but you notice they're not doing that much more damage than the worst carrier torpedo bombers I could make. It's because range doesn't matter. That 1400 kilometer range means nothing in carrier combat. So when you're designing carrier aircraft, there's a lot of things you can do with carrier aircraft. You can add extra modules. There's a whole bunch of things you can do, but Range doesn't matter if you're just fighting in naval combat. Now, if I wanted to order my torpedo bombers to, like, naval strike Pearl Harbor or something, that's different. You need range for that. But if you're just going into carrier battles, you don't need a range at all. 
All right, let's address the next myth or misconception, which is that naval upgrades are not worth it. And when people talk about naval upgrades, we're talking about ship upgrades. See, like I've got this North Carolina here that I could send in to refit and turn it into some upgraded version of North Carolinas. Now, when players tell you that naval upgrades and refits aren't worth it, that is shorthand for a much more complicated concept. And I want to go into that because as a new player, if you hear someone say naval upgrades are not worth it, you just hear, I should never refit a ship. You just look at this menu and you're just going to pretend these buttons don't exist and we're just never going to refit a ship. But the real thing about what's happening with naval refits and upgrades is a bit more complicated. And I even went through and I talked to a bunch of friends of mine who play the game and they had a diverse set of opinions on it. So I want to talk about what might be worth it, what is definitely not worth it, and what I consider to be worth it. Okay, so first of all, how does naval refits and upgrades work? Okay, when you have, we're gonna look at my outdated equipment for a sec here. Now, if you look through here, you see I've got all these ships here, okay? la di da di da di da all these, all these ships here. But what we're talking about upgrades, what we're talking about is taking one ship, like this naked North Carolina, which has these modules installed, and upgrading it via refit to same hull, but with different modules on it, okay? See, North Carolina B, very different modules from naked North Carolina, mainly because North Carolina B has like 30 different batteries, secondaries, radar, fire control, AA, planes. It's got all kinds of stuff on it. Okay, and then we've got like regular North Carolina and we've got North Carolina A, like we've got a bunch of different versions of North Carolina. So when you refit a ship, you can just select it and say, hey, I want to refit this ship and turn it into one of these other ships. And then the game will say, well, okay, it's going to cost you this much to refit the ship. So if I want to turn this naked North Carolina into North Carolina B, the game is going to tell me, uh, we're going to refit one ship. It's going to return to a naval base and will be docked there until the process is complete. With maximum dockyards assigned, it's going to take 1,200 days to complete. Now, this 1,207 days, that is so long that you could just build another new battleship. This is a terrible idea in this particular situation because North Carolina... Oops, no. Because the naked North Carolina is trying to go from this kind of a ship... To this kind of a ship you're literally like attaching extra main batteries and all kinds of other stuff it's insane don't do that that is obviously a bad idea and definitely that upgrade would not be worth it in fact i would say that the rule i would follow is you should probably never waste time trying to refit main batteries certain kinds of secondary batteries uh and engines and armor onto old hulls. Just build a new ship. It's faster and cheaper. But what about if I did something a little different? What if I just wanted to upgrade to this version of North Carolina? Okay, that's going to take 418 days. That would take less time to upgrade to this than it would to North Carolina B. This might be worth it, but again, at this point, yeah, if it, can't, it takes 418 days, you might just want to make that much progress on a battleship that actually has all the fancy gadgets you want on it. It's, it's not that great of an idea. But let me show you a situation where it would probably be definitely worth building. We're going to so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go up here to this naked North Carolina I have docked over here in, near Portland. And I'm going to click on my refit options and I have a different version of naked North Carolina. This is a naked North Carolina, but it has radar and fire control installed. Everything else is the same. 
and I'm going to click on it, and the game tells me it's only going to take 78 days to complete. We're going to put that in refit. Now, we want to remember that a Tier 3 going from no radar to a Tier 3 radar is going to result in better detection, but also better hit chance with batteries, and having better fire control is going to result in better hit chances. So this upgrade it takes 78 days but it's gonna significantly increase the firepower of the ship now this of course is just like a naked north carolina this is a stupid design but if we use the research cheat as the u.s and if i can quickly grab super heavy battleships so I'm going to just design a super heavy battleship real fast. We're going to put a battery on it. We're going to put some AA. Some super heavy batteries that everybody loves. Put some more secondaries on it. And we say, okay, this is the stats this ship is going to have. But now I want you to think, okay, so if we made this ship... We have to put default fire control on. If we made this ship, okay, we made this ship, and then later on we get better radar, wouldn't you want to take a few days to improve your hit chance with this massive firepower? That's when that refit might make sense. You're not ripping off turrets from a Montana or from a Yamato, but just installing some extra radar, installing some better fire control, and then you've got better to hit chances with all of this firepower that you're supposed to be bringing to bear with a ship like this. Our, our third myth or misconception is that surface ships with torpedoes are meant to counter capital ships. Now this is a selling point of the game, like this is an intended design decision. You just go back and read what the designers have to say. It's very clear that unscreened capital ships we're talking Yamatos we're talking Iowas are meant to be afraid of destroyers and light cruisers that have torpedoes but in terms of actual gameplay in the current version of Hearts of Iron surface ships with torpedoes don't do much in fact capital ships like battleships tend to wipe everything out even if the enemy has enough torpedoes to threaten them. Now, what I'm talking about, surface ship torpedoes are not useful against capital ships. Let me make it clear. Submarines, as we saw at the beginning of this video, submarines, yeah, they are perfectly capable of hunting down unscreened capital ships. It may take them a couple of tries, but they will torpedo them. But surface ships with torpedoes do not have the requisite balancing to defeat those capital ships. You might as well not waste time building dedicated surface ships with dedicated torpedo launcher mounts. If you've got old ships with torpedoes, eh, that's fine. If you want to make submarines with fancy torpedoes, good idea. But don't say to yourself, oh, I'm going to build some nice destroyers with torpedoes and torpedo upgrades, and we're going to mow down my opponent's screens, and then we're going to torpedo their fancy capital ships, because it's not going to work. And I have a battle for that. Okay, this fleet right here under Thomas Buell, who he's got the wonderful blockade runner trait. This fleet is the same IC cost as the four Yamatos. You saw me stalking those Yamatos earlier with submarines. We're attacking these Yamatos with surface ships now. He has a fleet that costs the same amount as the four Yamatos. Now this fleet has six heavy cruisers and 20 light cruisers. What are the design of these cruisers? Okay, the heavy cruisers are designed like this. They're, they're, they're primarily, these heavy cruisers are primarily designed to mow down enemy screens. Uh, you can tell because they've got the fancy secondaries. They're also designed to repel air attack. You can tell they've got a lot of anti-air. Uh, and these light cruisers are designed with torpedoes. They also have lots of light cruiser guns on them. And I want to note that both ships have the electric boat design company from the U.S., which 
it decreases their visibility and increases their maximum speed. We're going to talk about this designer later, but for right now, the ships that these Yamatos are engaging are sneakier and faster than the Yamatos are, which means that these, these light cruisers have a speed of 40 knots. They should have the Yamato should have a very hard time hitting them with anything other than light batteries. And they have solid torpedoes. They have nice tier 3 torpedoes on them. Let's see how this naval battle turns out. Okay. Now turn the AI off so the AI will not be wandering away individually. Now this, this naval battle has 4 Yamatos, 20 destroyers screening those Yamatos. So the Yamatos start the battle properly screened. The US fleet has 20 light cruisers screening 6 heavy cruisers. So the U.S. fleet is properly screened. Now, remember, I said that those heavy cruisers are designed to mow down destroyers. So ideally, what we should see here is that once the destroyers are wiped out, those Yamatos should be threatened by the torpedoes on the light cruisers. That's what should happen. So let's watch. We're going we're gonna to run the clock. Okay, now, okay, we've already got the destroyers are getting wiped out. Look at that. Like, I don't even have to waste hardly any time. And you'll notice that currently the Yamatos are basically taking almost no damage except a tiny bit of damage from the heavy cruisers because they're still currently screened. Their torpedoes are simply not going to reach them. Okay, we're going to run this clock a little bit more. Okay, the Japanese are running out of screens. Okay, the Yamatos are not screened properly anymore. And these, these destroyers are all about to die. Uh, again... The Yamatos have taken just a couple of tiny hits from the heavy guns on the heavy cruisers. The heavy cruisers do not have the firepower to pierce the Yamatos, so we would not expect them to take that much damage, of course. Uh, the heavy cruisers are taking some damage from the Yamato's guns, as we would expect. We do not expect heavy cruisers to be able to repel the firepower of the Yamatos. Uh, the light cruisers are doing just fine. Okay, all right, we're now at the point of the, of the battle where the Yamatos have no screens. We still have 20 light cruisers with those torpedo mounts that you saw all in the fight. In fact, all of these light cruisers are basically in pretty good shape. They Some of them took a little bit of damage from the destroyers, but they wiped the floor with those destroyers. U.S. heavy cruisers, two of them, the Bremerton and the Fall River, are retreating because they've been shot to pieces by the Yamatas. Again, we expect that. Heavy cruisers should not be winning gunnery duels with the Yamatas. But now we've got the light cruisers. They're in position to torpedo. And, um, guys, you want to torpedo the Yamatas? Guys. Guys, any day. And the Amato's escape. Now let's take a look at the at what happened here. We lost a heavy cruiser and a light cruiser to 20 destroyers. Now, the Yamatos took some damage. They really took some damage, but I want you to notice something. Uh the heavy cruisers are almost gone, the light cruisers are really shot to pieces. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna roll to the next battle. We know the Yamatos are not screened anymore we're going to start the battle with torpedoes ready to go okay maybe they should be able to win now now you'll notice that the fleet did detach some of the damaged ships so we're not going into battle with a full battle group of ships we're only going into battle with some ships and i've told the japanese ai to engage at all costs it's not going to be like adding ships or anything all right we're running okay naval battle has started surely we should be able to win now No? Nope. I want you to notice something. They are taking torpedo damage, but like the Yamatos aren't dying. They're just killing enemy ships. They're slowly killing off the light cruisers, even though the light cruisers should be massacring them. And the Yamatos get away. They took out a heavy cruiser. They did some damage to the other ships. Um, okay. Let's try again. Okay, we're going to come in and engage again. Okay, surely they could win now. No, that's a dead light cruiser. That's a dead light cruiser. That's a dead heavy cruiser. 
No, they're getting away. That's another dead light cruiser. That's another dead light cruiser. And the Yamato's escape. We take a look at the stats. Uh, the U.S. fleet lost another four light cruisers and another heavy cruiser. While the Yamato's are still afloat. And the remaining U.S. ships are not in great shape either. Now, you would think that if torpedoes on surface ships were useful, that we would be seeing better performance than that. Because they don't have any screens. The Yamatos have no screening at this point. They've been in two naval battles with no destroyers, and the torpedoes on those light cruisers have not sunk them or killed them or even... Let's take a look at them. I bet there are no... Let's see, are there even any critical hits? Now, if we take a look here, you can see that none of the ships even have, like... They don't have critical hits with, like, uh, blown-up engines or stuff like that. If you didn't know, in Hearts of Iron 4, ships can have critical hits on them that have permanent damage to the ship until it gets fully repaired. So that's that's not working. But, but maybe we're not... Look, maybe we're not testing it correctly. What if we put more torpedoes on it? Maybe that's the answer. We just need more torpedoes. So we're going to go with this ship design, the Go Faster. This is a light cruiser that has twice as much torpedo firepower on it. And we're going to see if that does better. Now, I've got a fleet of 19 light cruisers here. I'm going to order them to patrol the Philippine Sea just by themselves. And I'm gonna go talk to Japan. Japan has four Yamatos sitting in the Philippine Sea, fully repaired and ready to fight. Four Yamatos versus 19 light cruisers with torpedoes. The light cruiser should be able to do well, but let's see. Okay, I'm trying to engage, boom. We have a naval battle happening right now. Uh, Yeah, the Yamatos killed eight of them and seriously damaged the rest. And the Yamatos were barely hurt. Okay, let's try engaging again. All right, maybe Buell can win this time. And no, no survivors. Um, yeah, I don't think the torpedoes are, are helping much. I might have a different view of surface ship torpedoes if... The Yamatos were seriously injured and had critical hit damages, or if they just ran away like the Yamato ran away when engaging Tappy 3, because the Japanese saw, oh no, there's destroyer escorts and destroyers with torpedoes within torpedo range. Turn the Yamato around, get it out of there. If that one was happening in these naval battles, and they just had to flee every time without killing a lot of the torpedo bearing ships, that might be okay. But what we're seeing right now is that surface ships with torpedoes not doing a whole lot to capital ships. They're trying to it, but it, just bring your own capital ships or use air power or submarines to sink enemy battleships. Don't try to make torpedo cruisers or torpedo destroyers. You're wasting your time. Okay, this is one that's, that I had to talk with people on live stream about because they didn't even know. And some of my live stream viewers are very smart and they know a lot about the game but they were shocked when i showed them how the naval aircraft designer worked so let's talk about aircraft designers not every country gets every aircraft designer but the u.s and germany and a couple of other countries get something called the naval aircraft design company the naval aircraft designer design company designer design company yes i know it's very confusing because there is an aircraft designer but we're talking about design companies but it's called a naval aircraft designer the naval aircraft designer boosts range and naval attack on various types of aircraft and boosting naval attack is actually really important like you saw me using naval bombers earlier and you can make a lot of really neat interesting stuff with naval bombers like right here we've got an improved wildcat this is a carrier aircraft plane it benefits from the grumman naval aircraft designer because it's a carrier fighter so it gets a range and an agility upgrade now you probably don't care much about the range upgrade after what i showed you earlier but 
it's having an impact. And if you're going to make, say, carrier, uh, a carrier naval bomber, here we go. We've got the Mariner here, improved naval bomber airframe, crappy engine, crappy torpedo, but it's got the carrier naval bomber naval attack upgrade. So as you can see here, it has a naval attack of 14.3, not the 13 you would expect with this configuration in the summer beta of the game. Okay, that's a really nice upgrade. Um, is it the best upgrade? Eh, we could talk about that in a different place. But what I want to talk about is what that upgrade doesn't impact. Because we can see here, oh, it affects carrier casts. It affects their naval attack. You can see that this Helldiver with the new uh, armor-piercing bomb locks that are available in the summer beta, you can tell it's got a really nice naval attack. Like, there's a lot of neat things you can do. But there's a lot of things that that naval designer doesn't actually do. I want to talk about that. So we're going to go in and say, okay, I want to design a light airframe plane that can fly from land and that has a torpedo on it. Okay, right now you can tell Grumman applies. Okay, when you're designing planes in the aircraft designer, you'll know if the design company applies if it shows up in the lower right-hand corner. And right here it is. Boom. Okay, this plane, A-OK. -okay. Makes sense. It's got a torpedo on it. Makes sense that it would be affected by the uh, naval designer. Okay. What if I wanted to make a multi-role aircraft? Like I want to say, okay, we're going to put some heavy machine guns on it and put a torpedo on it. Here, let me go ahead and give it a real engine. Okay, this is a real plane with a real engine. Grumman doesn't apply. Even though this is a plane that can torpedo ships, the naval designer does not apply. Okay. What about a land-based plane with AP bomb locks, the new armor-piercing bomb locks? Now, if you're not familiar with these, the armor-piercing bomb locks, un unlike regular bomb locks, have much higher naval attack. So we're gonna put some armor-piercing bomb locks. Now, armor-piercing bombs are specifically designed to bomb ships. No naval aircraft designer. It's, it's not applying. Okay, so does it apply to this plane? All right, what about medium aircraft? Okay, what if I wanna make like a, a, a German Condor? A medium airframe, two engines, we're going to try and put some naval ordnance on it. Now, because of the way medium airframes work, I can't put a torpedo in the first slot. I have to put a medium bomb bay. So I put the medium bomb bay in there. Now, the medium bomb bay allows this plane to conduct port strikes. So this is a tactical bomber that can perform port strikes. So we're going to go ahead and put two engines on it that are tier three. But I want to focus this on naval, so I'm going to put torpedoes on there. Now it won't let me put three torpedoes, but it'll let me put tor two torpedoes on here, and it's got a, it's got a bomb bay that allows port strikes. No naval designer impact. The game does not consider this to be a naval bomber, so it is not getting the boost from Grumman. Even though you and I are both looking at this plane right now, and if you're looking at it with me, you're saying to yourself, "This is a a medium airframe naval bomber." No, it doesn't count. In fact, there is no medium airframe plane that I can design that will ever have the Naval Aviation Design Company impact it. I tried every combination I could think of. It never impacted it at all. I tried fighter versions. I tried recon versions. It didn't matter. Okay, so now you're saying to yourself, well, counterfactual, that must mean that you have to have a torpedo in the first slot for the game to think it's a nav and apply the Naval Aviation Design Company. And I'm glad you thought that, because that's what I thought, too. And so I'm like, okay, so we're going to build a four-engine naval bomber. We're going to put torpedo, torpedo, torpedo. It won't let me put four torpedoes on it. So we're going to put three torpedoes on there, and we're going to make the mother of all naval patrol bomber. Okay, so we're going to rename this plane to Super Nav. And take a look at super nav we'll notice it's using an improved large airframe 
It's got the torpedoes, and Grumman is not being applied. So if Supernav is not benefiting from the naval air designer, is there some other module we can use to make it apply? Maybe the game is thinking it's like a strategic bomber or something. So if we go into our special modules, we see we've got things like self-sealing fuel tanks, but we've got the flying boat. So we're going to apply the flying boat to this, and it's still not applying Grumman. Grumman simply doesn't apply. And that's because the naval air designer for Hearts of Iron 3 doesn't apply to any large airframes. So there's no way to get this bonus to naval attack to apply to the naval attack on an airplane like this. So don't try it. Don't waste your time. Our fifth misconception or myth or hearts of iron naval stuff today is about the rating designer. Now I call this the rating designer. Several countries have this designer and it's all called by different names, but it's generically, it's the rating designer. This naval designer for ships, you saw me use it earlier, emphasizes reduced visibility and increased maximum speed. And every time someone looks at this, they immediately look at submarine and go, ah, this is the designer you want for subs. It has a penalty to heavy attacks. You wouldn't want to use it for capital ships. Uh, it doesn't provide extra benefits to carriers that you care about because if you want carriers, you want deck space. Uh, and it doesn't have the cost reductions that the coastal de designer has. So everyone looks at this, especially new players, and they say, oh, I want to build submarines, so I should use this. If I'm not gonna focus on submarines, I shouldn't use this. You're wrong. Do not think of it like that. You need to instead think of this as actually a really good design company for capital ships and for submarines. Not necessarily for carriers, because carriers would prefer to have the extra aircraft from the deck space, but definitely battleships, super heavy battleships and submarines and like light cruisers and heavy cruisers all benefit from this design company. Let's talk about why. If you don't know, in Hearts of Iron 4, naval gunfire is affected by speed and visibility. Ships that are harder to see, they have lower visibility, are harder to hit with heavy batteries and light batteries. And ships that are moving faster are harder to hit with light and heavy batteries. So how would we test the effectiveness of this designer? Well, what I've done is I've cheated in four super heavy battleships for the US with a design that looks something like this. And if we go over to Japan, I've given them four super heavy battleships, same exact design. The only difference is Japan's using this naval designer, the one that gives them better armor and better heavy attack. And if we go back to the USA, I am using the designer that gives visibility and speed improvements. So we're using rating designer versus the capital ship designer. Now the Japan's designer is very specifically designed to make battleships better. It's unique to them. It's it's a really good designer for emphasizing capital ships, but we're gonna see if it's as good as the rating designer. Now I've already turned the AI off. I've got my super heavy battleships. They're gonna sail to the Philippine Sea and we're gonna duke it out. No admirals, but all ships have been trained up to this level. We're gonna see how that works. Now for the record, the U.S. ships had to sail underneath some Japanese navs. They took 0.02% damage. So they are going to start this naval battle at a very tiny disadvantage. Okay. We're going to force that engagement. We're going to detect them. Okay, we are now in battle. And we're going to see my battleships here from the U.S., including the very slightly damaged USS Iowa, versus the Japanese battleships. And we're doing it in bad weather in shark-infested waters. Uh, yeah. Ooh, look at that. Okay, so we're not even done with the battle. But the Japanese ships are fleeing. 
Uh, they've taken significant damages, especially from the heavy guns from the U.S. battleships. While the U.S. battleships, they've taken some damage, but they're coming out ahead. And that was very clearly a victory for the U.S. But neither side lost any ships. We're going to tag to Japan for just a second. And we can see that the Japanese ships were horribly mauled. Like, this ship's down to 4% strength. This one's at 43% strength. This one's at 61% strength. Uh, this one is okay. And they are not... They, 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 these ships are not in a position to fight anymore. And just, just to make it clear, if we go back and we take a look at the U.S. ships, I was kind of beat up a little bit. But the rest of them are in great shape. This is very clearly a victory for the super heavy battleships that have the rating designer. But what if it's the weather that's making that work? We fought that battle in a sea zone where there was terrible weather. Maybe we should go to a sea zone that's not having terrible weather. Like, we'll go to Bismarck Sea instead. So what we're going to do is we're going to order the U.S. fleet to go there. I'm going to tag over to Japan. I'm going to order the fleet that's there. Go to Bismarck Sea. I'm going to order the Japanese planes to not do anything there. I'm going to go back to the USA. I'm going to make sure that these guys are at no repair, always engage. And we're going to go tell the Japanese to not repair, always engage, no splitting off. Okay. And we're going to go back to tag USA. And we're going to see if this is going to work. We're going to see how this see how this functions all right the super heavies are in transit okay we are now in a naval battle okay there is some rain but this is not a thunderstorm this is going to reduce detection and naval speed and naval hit chance but remember that effect applies to both sides it's not just affecting the u.s and it's just not just affecting the japanese so let's see if this is going to work and no the weather the weather is still kind of rainy oh man this is going even worse all right the u.s ships okay they're shot up pretty badly but japan lost three or four super heavy battleships and this remaining super heavy battleship has six percent remaining strength it's going to take almost a year to get that ship fixed this is what i'm talking about the rating designer is not just for submarines. It's perfectly acceptable for capital ships. Even if you're not fighting in an actual thunderstorm, if there's just even a little bit of bad weather, you're going to be fine. Even in regular weather, you should be fine. And, and I do want to point out something that depending on time of year, there is a lot of bad weather all over the world. But... Even in good weather, we would be doing fine with that designer. So don't think, oh, rating designer, it's for subs. Well, no, it's it's for everybody. Everybody should be using the rating designer. If you've got it, use it. And I think that about wraps up our discussion of myths and misconceptions today. I hope that you enjoyed this video and, and that you found it helpful. Uh, I plan to do some other videos like this in the future if people want this kind of advice. And I hope that this video will also help you put into context other advice that you hear. Because there's a lot of good advice out there, but some of it really just assumes that you know certain things about the game. And if you don't know those certain things about the game, the advice is not necessarily as useful to you. We are having a lousy day for weather today where I am, but I hope things are working out better for where you are. And until my next video, I want to wish all of you a pleasant day and have happy hunting with your ships in Hearts of Iron 4.